Hello out there, everybody, and welcome to your next Mission Video Podcast. We have an important show today, Focus on Suicide Prevention. Dr. Tracy Neal Walton and Dr. Nicole Ayers from the Cohen Veteran Network will talk about what the na- what their nationwide system of clinics is doing to date our mental health challenges of our veterans, service members, and their families to help prevent suicide. Stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome to Your Next Mission video podcast, where we tell the stories of those who have served in the past and those who are serving today. From transition to financial wellness, VA benefits to mental health, we cover issues facing veterans, active military, and their families. Now here's your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army and co-founder of the American Freedom Foundation, Jack L. Tilly. Hello out there, warriors, past and present, your families, and thank you for your service to our great country. Before we get started, I personally want to thank our presented sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA for for making your next mission happen. They love our veterans and families. I'm going to say it every week. (laughs) We love them too. As I said earlier, we have an important show today focused on suicide prevention, especially as it applies to our, our veterans and active duty military community. And I'm so pleased to introduce retired Air Force Colonel, I'll make sure I get that correct now, Dr. Tracy Neal Walden, Chief Clinical Officer at the Cohen Veteran Network, and Dr. Nicole Ayers, Clinic Director of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic, Valley City, Lakewood, Washington. Just to let you know, I'm from Lakewood, Washington. And, oh, by the way, a military spouse. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you for coming on. And thank you. I'm going to start off by saying thank you guys for for what you do. And I know this is important work and you're helping a certain, a lot of people out, not just the service member, but also the, the family members and friends. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But before we do that, I'd like each one of you to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Dr. Walden, uh, can we start with you, ma'am? Sure, sure. Um, I served in the Air Force for 24 years. I'm a clinical psychologist, joined out of Philadelphia, joined the Air Force in order to complete my internship thought I was just going to do four years and then it turned into 24 because <laughs> I loved the mission. Yeah. Um, it's just been, it's, I had a great career, as you mentioned, retired in the rank of Colonel, got to serve all across the, the U S Korea, Iraq, um, really enjoyed what I, what I did and what I continue to do. And it's been a great opportunity for my family as well. I have two boys and the, GI Bill paid for my oldest to go to college. So, All right. <laughs> so it's been great. <laughs> Dr. Ayers, how about yourself? Yeah, I am uh, a military spouse. My husband served on active duty in the U.S. Army for All right. years. Yeah, he's getting ready to retire uh, next year. So um, we are in the process of what it would look like to transition in a veteran family. Um, our family has definitely gone through our share of deployments um, over the last 14, 15 years. Um, we have one daughter uh, who is seven years old and she's experiencing life as a military kiddo. Uh, we live coast to coast right now. So my husband's currently stationed at Fort Drum. We are here outside JBLM. Um, so we are working on two households. Um, as a professional, I'm a licensed clinical social, work, social worker and have a doctor in social work. I um, mean, it's really been my connection to the military community and watching people that we love and care about struggle with their mental health after deployments and struggle with transition um, that led me to go back to school to get my degree in social work and really focus on the treatment of trauma um, across generations, but also specifically how it impacts our military community as well as suicide prevention. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, I, I've been to Fort Drum, yeah. so I understand why you're living at Lakewood, Washington. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I have also been to Fort Drum. No, no. Well, it's, Drum's a good place, but it is sort of isolated up there. And it's it's yeah. really, I always feel sorry for the military spouses or whatever, but uh, because, they're, you know, it's it's tough sometimes when you have a career and, and you have to, you know, move somewhere or PCS somewhere to, to get your uh, spouse to work. Dr. Walden, would you, would you give us an overview of the Cohen Veteran Network and, you know, how they uh, serve people, how they serve our veteran community? Yes, absolutely. So um, Cohen Veterans Network, it's founded by um, Mr. Stephen A. Stephen Cohen. Um, his son served in the Marines and his son came back and said, 
dad, this is where you need to put your money. You know, I, I have buddies who are having difficulty. Veterans need help. And so um, he met with General Mullen and our CEO, um, Dr. Hassan, and they launched Cohen Veterans Network in 2016. Uh, we with one clinic in New York, and now it's expanded to 24 clinics across the U.S. Um, what I think is is most important about our network: we're a non for profit, a not for profit, excuse me, um, serving post 9/11 veterans, active duty service members as well, and their families. And family is defined however the veteran defines it. And that's really important because when, when veterans have difficulty, it doesn't just impact the veteran, it impacts the family. Um, approximately 45% of, of the clients served are family members. Yeah. So we're really proud of that. Well, one of the things I heard, I, you know, we have a Cohen clinic down in, uh, in Tampa, just out, right in the edge of Tampa there. But but uh, one of the things somebody told me, and I think you touched on it right there, if I have a friend that I'm, I have a relation, you know, you know, we're good buddies and he knows probably more about me, I, he can also go there for counseling too and, and assist you. So it's it's good therapy for, for all of you there. So I, I uh, Susan Barber, you know, it's always been a top priority, but Dr. Harris, you know, how do you guys really address those issues? I, I mean, it, they're so big, there's so many of them. And and I'm not sure sometimes that uh, we talk a lot about it in the military. I know we do talk about it in the military, but it really sort of impacts you when you sort of get out of the military, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, it impacts on both ends. We know that, you know, suicide is the second leading cause of death among the military community of our yeah. members, right? And so our clinics across the nation are really trying to get ahead of the issues before it becomes a crisis, before it becomes a critical issue. Um, where we're having to be in a life or death situation in that moment. And so we do that in a number of ways. Um, our teams go through a lot of military cultural competency training, in addition to just many of us being connected to the community. Um, so we start from the very moment you walk into our clinic or you contact our clinic that we have an understanding of the military community and the needs of the military community. Um, we create a place where you feel welcome and like the, the team that's there gets you. Um, we work to remove the barriers to care. And so we have flexible hours, um, have flexible um, definitions of what it means to be a veteran, what it means to be a family member, as um, Dr. Neil Walden had talked about is, you know, we serve regardless of discharge status or combat experience. Um, we serve family members as defined by that veteran. Um, so it, it could be that friend or that loved one or a niece or a nephew or a mom or whoever is that support system. Um, and we also, if you are in crisis, if we didn't catch you before things um, kind of got critical, we can treat you the same day. People can walk in, they can call, they can get support immediately from one of our really highly trained qualified professionals. Um, and then we also take a public health approach through offering um, services through our outreach programs like mental health first aid, which is not only for the people that we serve coming into our building, but we offer these trainings to our community as a whole. Um, one of the unique things that, that I do in Lakewood as well is I offer military cultural competency training to civilian providers. Um, so that civilian providers that are also interacting with our military community um, can be more thoughtful and intentional about the way they engage with our service members, our family members, and our veterans in our communities. Yeah, I always tell everybody, you know, there's a, a lot of people in the civilian, sector, the civilian sector doesn't know don't know much about the military. And so sometimes I wish there was a national show that, you know, start talking about veteran, the veteran committing and stuff a, a little bit more. And, and, and as I go through here, Dr. Uh, Walden, if you ever want to jump in and, and add something to what she said, please do that. Uh, I appreciate it. Dr. Walden, what, what do you think is really important when people, you know, really to people understand about suicide? I mean, there's a lot of people that talk about suicide and, and there's a lot of, and I guess you probably hear mixed information sometimes. So what's, what's, what should people really understand? There are a lot of misconceptions about suicide. And so it's really important for people to understand what's true. Um, within our network, we did a survey in 2021 um, called America's Mental Health Suicide Prevention Survey to address both the myths and the facts about suicide. And it's interesting, about 45% of Americans believe that suicides happen suddenly or on a whim. Um, and 36 believe that it's it's best not to ask someone who's having thoughts if they're take if they're thinking about taking their life. Both of those are huge myths. 
individuals who are thinking of, of taking their lives often exhibit signs. They, they may give away possessions. They, um, they often have significant risk factors, um, family difficulties, financial difficulties, and maybe work-related difficulties, substance misuse. So there are factors involved in which someone can intervene. And then you definitely should ask someone if they're thinking of taking their life. If someone is feeling down, you wanna ask them how they're doing. Um, if someone has indicated, um, you know, oh, I just don't know what I'm gonna do. I, I'm not sure if I can go on. You wanna ask, what do you mean by that? Um, how can I help you? How can I get you help? I think oftentimes people think that if they ask someone, are you thinking of hurting or killing yourself, that they're going to put that idea in the person's head. And that's absolutely not true. Oftentimes, someone wants someone to ask them something. So you want to ask, you want to find out, and then you want to help get them to the care that they need. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that always amazes me, one is that you know, I was trained in the military for years to keep things to myself. You know, I, I'd focus, I mean, I'm just, you know, if it, it my, my job is to complete the mission. And so uh, I'm not going to go in there and talk, and I'm not going to ask for a lot of assistance. And I really think that probably more senior people in the military, senior NCOs, senior officers, and stuff, probably don't want to reach out for help. And, and so that's a struggle. And then the other thing is, is we have to talk more about what kind of culture shock that you're going to go through when you get out of the service. I, I don't know. I'm sure you did, ma'am. And I know what I know I did when I went out. I, 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 tell, I always tell people it's a little funny story. Say uh, when I got out of service, <laughs> really, I, you know, I built a house just uh, just down in Florida, great house, six bedroom, three car garage on a golf course. Perfect. The problem is once we built the house, I, I ran out there and started introducing myself to people. And my wife says, those guys think you're crazy because uh, <laughs> there, there's no... Uh, they don't, they haven't walked in my boots. Right. They don't feel the same way I feel. And so you have to have somebody that's around you that, that feels like you. So you have to find, and we just talked about a minute ago, we, we have yes. to find our tribe. We have to yes. find the people that we feel comfortable with. And and that's exactly. a struggle. Yeah. Dr. Ayers, you want to add anything that I, I should go back over? You guys want to add and just jump right there. Dr. Ayers, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think what, you know, what um, Dr. Nolan is talking about is it's so essential to ask the question. Um because these myths and, and learn about the myths and facts, because the myths are some of the biggest barriers that people find to reaching out for help and asking for help. Um, and absolutely, there's a huge transition from being active duty to the civilian workforce or the civilian community, um, just because the, the culture that allows people to be successful in the military and get the mission done of putting, putting the mission first, putting your brother or sister in arms next to you first, um, often leads to you putting yourself second, third, fourth. Um, and really it's, you know, when we get out and we transition and we're struggling, we, we have to be also be able to put ourselves first so that we can continue the mission, so that we can continue to support the people we love and care about. We can continue to live on and do the things that are important to us. You know, no, I've got a, 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 a ma'am, you're, you're, you're already been, you've been out for a little while anyway. So I, I assume you're married. Are you married? Yes. Okay. Yes, so, so you went through that struggle of transition and I'd be yes. interested to see what, how you work through that. And, and you're getting ready to go through that with your husband. And, and what are you talking to him about right now? So, you know, ma'am, let's start with you. Well, how yeah. did you work through your struggles when you, you know, when you got out that transition for yourself? Well, it's really important to find that that sense of community. And, and yeah. initially, I was, I was planning on going straight into a government job because that felt safe to me. You know, those were still my people where, you know, I would still be working with the Department of Defense. But then the CVN opportunity came came about and I, I jumped at that. And what was so great about it was that it was still a sense of community. Yeah. That was really important to me. If I didn't have that, I think I would have really, really struggled. And I decided to retire in the area that we're in in order to support my husband. My husband followed me all around the U.S. for 24 years. He's not, he looks very military, but he's not. <laughs> um, and so he had a great job here. He finally was able to, you know, 
secure a job and stay in that job. And so I wanted to give him the opportunity to continue to do so. But, you know, Sergeant Major, you talked about that sense of community. That was essential to me during that transition because it, it's frightening when you, you know, you have to figure out what to wear every day. <laughs> you have to learn a new language. Yeah, absolutely. Language. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, same question. Now, I would assume now that you're you're prepping your husband about getting out of military and things you got to go through. Though, so what are you doing to get him ready to go here? As much as you can. It's different when it's coming from your partner or spouse, right? Like, yeah, yeah, that's um, important. Yeah, um, I think really. Incur- I mean, my husband enlisted at the age of seventeen, so he has known the military his entire adult life. And we just had a conversation recently. He was uh, informed about what Tricare looks like after the military, which is like healthcare is so expensive. Like, we got to talk about and figure this out. Um, and all of these new experience that you don't have to think about when um, you're active duty and uh, all of this stuff is kind of just a, a secondary thing that's going on in the background. Um, but I agree, we've, t- I've, we've talked a lot about it, like just give himself some time to think about what he enjoys outside of yeah. the military. Yeah. Um, you know, we, and what does he enjoy in the military? He enjoys, he loves mentoring soldiers. Um, he loves teaching, he loves leadership. And so figuring out how, how does that connect to what he is going to enjoy in the civilian workforce but also just encouraging him to take some time to just figure those things out, network. Um, and that's in, you know, what Dr. Noel Walden was talking about, that building community. I think in my own clinic, that has been our greatest success is that probably 70 to 80% of my team is connected to the military themselves. And so our culture looks a lot like our connection to the military and our military culture. Yeah. So everybody steps up, chips, chips in and makes sure that our mission is successful, which is really giving back and serving our military community. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things is you don't, you don't know how tired you are. So I think when you do get out of the service, you need to take, you know, 30 days, 45 days. But the, but there's a point, it's in your DNA to go back to work and start working. Uh, you know, so yeah, so you can't sit there for a long time. And I think, like yeah. we said before, I think the people that struggle are the ones that get out and just can't figure out what to do. Yes. And, and they need to, and they just start asking questions. Hey, what do I do? How do we get out of there? Hey, this is a great discussion. We're going to take a quick break. I know you guys aren't going to go anywhere. We'll, we'll be right back with you. <laughs> We're talking with Dr. Tracy Neal Walden and Dr. Nicole Ayers of the Cohen Veteran Network. And you're watching your next mission video podcast with me, your host, Jack L. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army. And we're here each week to, to help you and your family with information you can use. So please, like us, click on that subscribe button below. Also click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications of you know all of our upcoming podcast releases. Dr. Ayers, what do you think we need to be aware of specifically when it comes to uh, suicide among you know veterans and service members? Yeah, I think one of the less frequently things that I come across being talked about is that secure firearm storage is suicide prevention. Um, right? I mean, I, I'm going to stop you real quick. Every military person that gets out has a weapon. Yes. Uh, and that's, and that's, yeah, no, I got that. I, I mean, I'm not going to tell you how many I have, but, but that's something that's, uh, that's really, that's tough, but go ahead. I'm sorry. It has a weapon and also knows how to be safe and knows how to use it. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. not somebody who's unfamiliar with it. And yeah. so, you know, we know that 71% of deaths by suicide among veterans is with a firearm and 83% of service member service member firearm deaths is the result of suicide. And so we know that also know that uh, programs that focus on preventing like direct access to lethal means report a 91% reduction in suicide deaths. And so proper firearm storage, that's, you know, securing it, having it locked, securing it unloaded, um, is suicide prevention, not only just for that veteran or service member, but for their entire family. Um, you know, having an unsecured firearm in a house not only increases the risk for that service member, um, but it increases the risk for the children in their home, the family member in their home. Um, and it's really about not removing somebody's access to firearms permanently, but the goal is to increase the time and space one person has between the thought of suicide and the ability to carry out that thought. Um, and so yes. we create physical barriers with lock storage. We can create emotional barriers with things like gun covers and images, or even just problem solving. You know, people have firearms for a reason. How do we temporarily increase time and distance when you're in a crisis or a loved one's in a crisis between your direct access to that lethal means? Um, and lethal means isn't just firearms. It's just very common in the households that we serve. Um, but these are also things like medications, um, mm-hmm. knives and other sharp objects. If somebody is thinking of asphyxiation, I mean, this is uh, belts and things like that. We want to be able to create time and distance so that somebody has the opportunity to change their mind. 
Yeah. Um, people often often do and want to. Yeah. yeah, I think I think one of the other big things too is that uh, you know I think sometimes the iPhone and computer is a downfall because we don't talk to each other as much as we used to. They've got to get out there and start talking about this. So, uh, Ma'am, was you going to say something? No, did, did you want to chime in? Yeah. Yes. I, well, I just wanted to add in. You know, Dr. Ayers was talking about um, you know gun gun locks and gun safes, but they're medication safes as well, and those are incredibly important to prevent accidents as, as well as attempts um, to, to actually kill yourself. Um, so it, it's great for suicide prevention as well as accidental overdose. And, and they're so cheap. You can, you can get one on Amazon to just secure those medications. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, I, I don't do that. Of course, it's just me. I have an older son that's uh, that stays with us, a handicap, but uh, and he never bests with it because he's got his own medication there. But uh, but that's that's really a good point because people come out and and sort of reach. The other one that really concerns me sometimes. A lot of times, I'll take my weapons when I have my grandkids come over uh, mm -hmm. with the ammunition. I'll put I'll put it in my safe. I have a safe downstairs. I put it in to yeah. sort of protect. I always worry about. Uh, about my children getting, uh, you know, getting a hold of the weapons and stuff. But, but I also yeah. tell you that, that I think it's important for us to teach people how to properly use a weapon, uh, if, mm -hmm. especially in today's society. Let's be honest about that. We need to know, and I think most, I'm not most, but I would probably say just about all veterans know exactly how to hold a weapon, how to secure a weapon, how to shoot a weapon. But I think what happens is you get a little complacent sometimes and you leave that weapon laying around. But this is one of the things that we gotta you certainly gotta talk about all the time. Dr. Wall, do do military veterans struggle with suicide more than the civilian uh, the uh, civilian counterparts? I mean, is the suicide rate higher in the in the military? That that's a really difficult one because because we have great data. And so the Department of Defense and, and Veterans Affairs um, do a great job of identifying deaths by suicide for our active duty members and our veterans. Within the civilian um, sector, sometimes the data may not be as clear. And so it, it's hard to determine if we're at higher risk than civilians. I think globally, um, it's a concern for everyone. But for our um, our veterans and our veteran families, you know, I want to go back to something that you said earlier, Sergeant Major. There are potential risk factors. We we're we're a society where we're told to do something and we just do it, and you know, we're you know, we don't want to be broken. We want to be you know, ready to go, ready to do our job, and not mention any difficulty. And so it may be hard for a veteran to actually seek care and admit that they're struggling. And so that's where I think it really becomes difficult. And we need to normalize the fact that it's okay to seek care. Yeah. I think one of the things, that, maybe I told you that already, ma'am, but one of the things I did the other day, a couple of weeks ago, I called the, the Army G1 and says, hey, look, you know, I just, I just want to give you a tip of advice. Why don't we put uh, culture, what the culture uh, is going to be when you get out of the service. Let's start talking about that a lot earlier before we ever get out. Because I think the struggle is, is it's just so tough when you get out, yes. especially if you don't find a job. Uh, yes. That's that's another issue. I mean, when do you start that process of getting out of service? And uh, and that's it's just so difficult because I, I'm, now I've got to admit, when I was on active duty, I was a 200% soldier. Uh, you know, every day, and we, you talked about your husband, every day I'd go to work, my wife, my, I, you know, I, my wife would take care of everything. I mean, I deployed, I was gone, I was, I'd come home, I'd sleep on the couch, get up the next morning, I'd move out. And uh, I did that for 36 years. In fact, the last assignment I had in the Army, uh, I traveled 800,000 miles in like 300, uh, three and a half years. Uh, so I was always gone, always doing something. And so again, I, it goes back to the spouse. Uh, she did so much. So I would say that the spouse knows more about, you know, each other than anybody else. And one of the yes. things I've always wondered about is, is how many spouses commit suicide? I mean, that's something I don't know if we track that or not. Do we, do you guys track that? We don't. That would be tracked by the CDC. And again, that data, oftentimes um, it's, 
it's the person isn't listed as a military spouse, so we wouldn't know. Um, but our military spouses, they they are um, potentially at risk because oftentimes I I feel like they are often overlooked. Um, it's often not um, appreciated all the work that they do behind the scenes. You know, you talk about your wife, and I can just imagine you as you know Sergeant Major traveling all over the the world. Um, and her having to handle everything at home. You know, I I went to Korea when my youngest was four and my husband took care of everything. And then what that was when my oldest was four. And then I did Iraq when my youngest was one. And Jeff took care of everything. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's not looked at and, and it really should be. It should be. Well, the other thing is, and and we'll take a quick break here in a minute, but you know, my, my uh, I had two separate checking accounts. I allowed my wife to, uh, you know, have her own account, have her own money. Everything was going good. Uh, and I had my own separate account. account. Mm -hmm. In fact, I never, ever, you know, all these PCSs I had, She, oh, I would always go first. She'd move everything else. I mean, she did everything. You know, and that, and, uh, yeah. So, so when I got out of service, I'm sure you'll do the same thing. I said, hey, look, uh, for, for the rest of my life, whatever you want to do, whatever I, you know, you want to do, you just do it. Uh, but but you got to have it's all about relationships. It's all about understanding what's going on, and and it really boils down to talk to each other, uh, yes. stay in that community, find that tribe, find where you fit in, and uh, if you don't think you fit in, start talking to somebody. You know mm -hmm. that's for sure. Hey, this is a great this is a great topic, and and I wish we could talk about this for three or four hours, but. But we got we got to take another quick break. So stay tight there, right there. I'm going to be right back in a few minutes there. Don't you go anywhere. We'll be right back. You've been watching Your Next Mission video podcast. You're watching Your Next Mission video podcast, proudly presented by Navy Federal Credit Union, the most trusted credit union owned by members of the military community, serving all branches of the armed forces and their families. Their members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. Purdue Global. You're ready for a comeback, and with Purdue Global, you can do more than take classes. You can take charge of your story, of your career, of your life. Earn a degree you can be proud of and get an education employer's respect. Start your comeback at purdueglobal.edu. USAA. A promise is a trust not to be broken. Whether spoken with an oath or sealed with a pinky. And after 100 years, we're still taking care of the military community and their families. That's our mission, always. Now back to your host, the 12th Sergeant Major of the Army, Jack L. Tilly. Welcome back. We're blessed to be here today with Dr. Tracy Neal Walden and Dr. Nicole Ayers from the Cohen Veteran Network. And I want all of our viewers to reach out to them directly. Tell me about your transition. We're talking about relationships here. We're talking about working with each other. Tell us what topics you want us to cover. You know, this is, uh, I always say this is not my show. This is our show. We're all part of a family. The only difference is, remember, I, the only difference is I'm not going to give you any money. So, but it's your show. And, and I want you to tell me what you want me to put on or tell us what you want to put on the show. You can call or text me at 844 424-1134, and I'll reach back out to you. Or send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. We're heading into our final segment with you now, and I, I really hope you've enjoyed it just as much as I have, and I just have a couple more questions. Dr. Walton, September has been uh, Suicide Prevention Month, and you launched a campaign highlighting the, the ripple effect of suicide. You know, what, what is the ripple effect? Yeah, the ripple effect is is something that I think people often don't think about. But for every death by suicide, it's been found that at least 135 other individuals are impacted by it. Yeah, there's been lots of research to to show this, and those those other people are family members, children, spouses, you know, cousins, aunts, uncles, so extended family, coworkers. The therapists who are working with these individuals, if there is a therapist, but there's a, a wide range of individuals who have had some sort of relationship with the individual who's died by suicide. And as a result of that, it, it puts them at risk. 
we know that if a child has a parent who's died by suicide, it increases their risk of later dying by suicide or at least attempting, uh, you know, threefold. So it's it's extremely significant. And so we we want to be aware of this ripple effect so that we can intervene, hopefully intervene early um, and so that there is no death by suicide. But in the cases in which we cannot, we can intervene with those families. And so there's something called postvention. And it's where you intervene with the families, you intervene with the therapist, the other staff in the therapy office or the physician's office, you know, the primary care's office, whomever have been impacted by this, or even the, the emergency room, um, so that they can get care. So they may need someone to talk to. Um, one of the things that we have in our clinics is we have case management services. And so our case managers are able to reach out to then support those family members when there is a death by suicide. Because if, if the veteran dies, they may have been the sole breadwinner. Um, and so there may, there may still be some income coming into the family, but not as much. And so, is the family going to have housing insecurity, food insecurity? So they need that additional wraparound support. And that's what we provide that to all of our uh, all of our clients and all of our veteran families. But we especially lean in when there's a death by suicide. Yeah. Dr. Harris, I, I had a good friend here. Uh, now it's been over probably over a year ago that uh, that I was a senior non-commissioned officer that I, I knew quite well that I served some time with. Uh, in a couple of different assignments in, in the military. And uh, one day, uh, his wife left to go shopping. He let the dog out, walked down to the woods and committed suicide. And, and, I, and what you just said about the ripple effect just makes so much sense to me because he, I mean, here's a guy that uh, probably was, uh, you know, probably had thousands of people that were, uh, that were his friend. Uh, that was associated with him. So in some cases, I'd probably say that 135 is probably a lot more if you're in the military. Because, you have, I mean, for me, when I was a Sergeant Major of the Army, I was the senior enlisted guy for 1.3 million people. Of course, I didn't know all those people. I mean, I wish I did, but I didn't. But but I got made contact with a lot of people. And I think at those levels, it, it's just tough. It's just so tough. That's that's just staggering. I, again, this is this is something that we have to do as a nation do more about it, start talking more about it, do something about it. And I, I think one of the things I told somebody yesterday, I said, it's funny, it's not funny, but it's it's amazing to me that uh, that we talk about suicide prevention when we get out of the service. Why don't we talk to it? Why or talk a lot more about it when we're in the service? And, and we just don't do enough about that, I don't think anyway. Dr. Aaron says, part of your campaign, how are we offering the proactive approach to helping people and you know, as far as prevention of suicide? Yeah, our team has leveraged our expertise to develop a lot of resources that's available to anybody in the community, um, but it's expi explicitly geared towards our military community. And so we have things like practicing prevention question and answer, um, which allows people to learn the facts about suicide, which can go a long way to not only providing support um, for somebody who's experiencing thoughts of suicide, but also being able to re-educate around common myths that frequently act as those barriers for individual reaching out to help, whether it's within their support system or the larger healthcare system. Um, and so those, we have a quiz on our site um, and those look a little bit, some of them are like a scenario where, you know, what should you do if a friend says, what is the point of living anymore? Um, and I'll give you a quick answer. That answer is ask them directly of if they're having thoughts about suicide. Um, and then we also have questions that are around myth busting. And so one of those myths is that you only experience a suicidal crisis if you have a mental health condition, um, which we know is false. There's lots of other life circumstances that may lead somebody to consider suicide. Um, we also have our ways to support chart, which shows the many ways that a loved one can help um, somebody experiencing a mental health crisis and learn what to say and do, whether it's helping them process what's going on, helping them engage in problem solving, taking their mind off that stressor for a bit, or just offering to help them call and get connected to another resource. Um, and then we also have a document on the coded language of suicide. Um, and you know, these are individuals who may be thinking about suicide and sharing signs of that emotional distress, whether it be on social media, um, in conversations, and helping people learn what does that actually look like? 
Um, and so, for example, somebody feeling like they're a burden, they may sound like I messed everything up or they'd be better off without me or I'm not I'm not any good. I'm not I'm useless. Right. Um, or if somebody's feeling hopeless, they may sound like nothing I do matters um, or it's out of my control. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of resources on um, and tools that we've created to share to the community. Yeah. One of the things I always worry about is having too much stuff out there. Yeah. yeah. And so, so is there a website? I mean, that's a lot of stuff yes. you talked about, but a lot of items. So how, how do I find those items? I mean, is there a website or somewhere to go to or, and the other question I'm going to ask both of you this question, is there an, is there an average age or like, is it 18 to 24 more suicides than, than 45 to 50? Have we ever tracked You know, what the average is, is there an average there as far as uh, on, on prevention of suicide or suicides? Yeah, so the first question, the website, so that is cohenveteransnetwork.org forward slash suicide prevention. Okay. Um, that is where you can access all of our tools and resources. Um, yes, there is um, some age data we know, but it, it also, there's a lot of other factors that factor into that. So we know um, that suicide among youth is increasing and has increasing. Um, and so it is one of the leading cause of death among youth. Um, we also know that LGBTQA plus veterans are seven times more likely to die by suicide than veterans who don't belong in that community. So I think age is a factor, um, but there's also several kind of intersectional um, situations and identities and experiences that people have that may increase their risk um, just given their life experiences and their interactions with kind of the world around them. Wow. Yeah, I never, that's amazing to me. It's just, uh, it's just, it's just a short. Dr. Wall, yeah, what, what, go ahead. Yeah. I want to just add on a little bit. I want to foot stomp our website. It's cohenveteransnetwork.org. And when you go to the, our website, you can individuals can find information about how to seek care. And so they can just click on the website and they can type in their information or they can call us. There's the phone numbers there to get connected with us. Um, they can get connected with an individual clinic. Uh, they can get information about the services that we need. And if they're in crisis, the number is there for the veterans crisis line, 988. And when you dial 988, if you're a veteran, press option one, and you're going to get connected to individuals who have that military cultural competency. They're familiar with working with veterans. And their 988 is great. They have a lot of other options. You press option two if you're Spanish speaking. And if if you speak a language other than Spanish or English, there are other options for that as well. And then you press option three if you are in the LGBTQ plus population, as Dr. Ayers mentioned, um, because they do tend to be at, at much higher risk. So there are lots of resources out there. Um, and I agree with you, Sergeant Major, there's so many that it can become overwhelming. But if you go to our website, um, it's actually really easy and quick to find the resources that you need. Yeah, well, that's that's great information. So so for the people listening today, that they gave you some website, they get, then how to find a phone number, and uh, and I really like the fact that uh, you need to talk to somebody. To find, what frustrates me more than anything else is when I call somebody and say, "Well, hold," and you get you know a voice say, well, "Okay, what do you want?" I want to talk to a person. The other thing is when I call or, or email you, that's just between me and you, right? And nobody yes, else gets absolutely. involved. I mean, that's that's private information. Whatever I say is is between us as far as whatever yes. my issue is. or the family, whatever you lease, I guess, right? Yes, it's private information. Um, if the individual becomes a client, we have a secure medical record, which is private information. We don't share it with anyone unless the individual has signed a release for us to do so. The only time that we would notify someone else is if we were afraid for someone's safety. Then we, but we would also let them know we're going to assist you in getting you additional care and support and walk them through that. Yeah, I, I'm going to ask you a couple of additional questions. I went ahead. One is that I heard the other day that uh, uh, in our criminal justice system, about 25 percent of the people that are incarcerated, which comes out to be about 180 thousand, I guess, uh, are veterans. Yes. So does the Cohen uh, Clinic tie to the? Uh, they have a, a veterans court system. Veterans court. Yeah. Yes. Do you, do you guys tie to that and sort of help those guys or gals that are coming in there with the? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. 
Absolutely. All of our clinics work with the local veterans court system oh, because great. we know that many people who um, who are discharged due to conduct difficulties and then they get into trouble when they're, uh, you know, after they're separated from the military, oftentimes there may be mental health issues related to that or substance abuse issues. And so um, we want to decrease that recidivism. We don't want individuals going back into the court system. And so we've developed relationships with the veteran courts so that they can refer them to us so that we can help them to decrease the probability of them going back into the court system. I'm so glad that you did that. Yeah. Prison. That that's so important, Doctor. Did you want to say? I see you start to say something. Did you want to say something like oh, that? No. Okay. Absolutely. No, I feel okay. No, absolutely. No. I, well, let me let me say it. that is so good that you're do that you're doing that because uh, the other thing I when we was talking about the uh, incarceration there that they they told us that a lot of the people that are incarcerated are a little bit older uh, and that are incarcerated and the crimes are a little bit worse sometimes. And uh, I, do, you, do you ever try to work with? prisons about that stuff or the veterans in those kind of communities? Probably not. I, I don't know. That's, it would be a good idea it, if you did. Yeah, it really varies. And I'm totally blanking on it right now. But one of our clinics uh, is doing a virtual group with a local prison Oh wow! Um, in order to provide that support. And so that's, it's, it's a form of prevention. It's more tertiary prevention. But you know, helping them before they even leave the prison so that then they, they have some tools beforehand. So we have done some work in that area. Well, I, I would think still more. Yeah, I would think if you was in prison, you're doctrinated. I mean, you're struggling there anyway. So it, it's almost, uh, I'm not going to say it's like being in the military, but you're isolated mm -hmm. and you come out yes. of there and you're trying to figure out how to fit in again. So that's that's an interesting yeah. issue. That's that's I mean, I'm good on you if you're doing that. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say to somebody listening to us right now that's uh, that that that's thinking maybe about suicide? What would you say to them, Doctor Walden? What would you say to them to sort of give them some advice? I guess. I would say talk to someone. I would say do not be afraid to talk to someone. If you don't feel comfortable talking to a family member, contact us. Contact. 988, contact Vets for Warriors. There's so many different resources there, but talk to someone. What often happens is that, you know, we face challenges in our lives and we, we kind of, we get in our head and it often feels like it's a challenge that we can't overcome. Yeah. So get some help so we can, we can help you problem solve through that situation because Suicide is a permanent solution, often to a problem that's not permanent. Yeah, yeah that's, that's tough. Doctor, Dr. Ayers, what, what would you say to somebody who's worried about maybe a loved one? Uh, what should they do? I mean, you got a loved one, somebody like you know, my spouse or something like, what would you say to them? I think first and foremost, don't be afraid to ask the question, Yeah. right? And ask the question directly. Are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about ending your life? Um, and be prepared to hear yes. Um, we don't want to ask the question of like, well, you're not thinking about it, are you? Um, because that doesn't invite somebody to give an honest answer. Um, most of the time, people really want somebody to ask and people are struggling and trying to connect with loved ones, friends, colleagues, and they just don't, they're not sure how. And most of the time, they're going to contact somebody in their community before they ever contact somebody like me, a mental health professional, right? And so if members of our community are willing to ask the question, that helps us fight stigma associated with both mental health and suicide and opens the door for somebody to get life-saving support. Like it, mm -hmm. asking the question can literally save a life. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, first of all, let me say that, uh, thank you guys for what you're doing. I mean, this is, uh, you, 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 you have a, you're tied to the military, no matter, you know, as a Colonel, when you get out, you'd be tied for the rest of your life. And, and as a military spouse, I mean, you care and you want to give back and your husband, I mean, it, it's just a lot of good stuff, but, uh, you know, we're a very small community, but you guys are doing some, some, uh, some great things to help our veterans, families, and, and their friends. And, and I just say, it's just great talking to you today. And I appreciate, again, all the things that you guys are doing. Any, any final thoughts, anything you uh, want to share with the audience? And Dr. Wall, we'll start with you, man. Anything you want to share? That maybe we forgot. I would just, I would go back to, you know, it's okay to ask for help. 
ask for help, seek out help. And it's okay to make mistakes because oftentimes, you know, when we're in the military, we want to do everything just right. And so someone may transition and you may transition and that first job, it just doesn't feel right. And so you move on to another job and that's, that's okay. You're figuring out your way. And I think sometimes we, as, as, as military members and veterans, we need to give ourselves some grace um, and realize that we're, we're learning. Think back to, you know, when you first joined the military, when I first joined, I couldn't even figure out where to put the stuff on my uniform. (laughs) I was one of those officers, like where I needed, I needed my, uh, my senior enlisted, um, person to kind of help me get myself together. So, and, and I asked for help because I wanted to be put together. And so you ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Dr. Ayers, how about yourself? Any final thoughts, anything you want to share with the audience? Yeah, I think really echoing what Dr. Neil Wallen's saying and just kind of a different reframe is, you know, when you get on an airplane, there's a reason they tell you to put your mask on before you help somebody else on the plane, right? Yes, you can absolutely help other people on the plane without that mask, but that's time limited. Eventually you're gonna run out of oxygen and then you're out of luck. Um, When we take care of ourselves, when we put our mask on first, we can show up for others longer. We can show up for our families, our goals, our mission long-term. And so I really encourage people to ask for help, but also remember that our mental health and our mental fitness is just as essential as our physical health. it is, you know, even maybe more so sometimes, because if we are mentally not doing all that great, physically, we're probably not going out and doing that run or, or lifting those weights either that we're not taking yes. care of our physical health. And so really do reach out. Our clinics are here for you. And our clinics are just an amazing resource. Not only do we have, you know, some similarities across our network, but then also each clinic is really embedded in its local community and mm-hmm. is able to do some really unique, cool things to support their local military community. Um, and so it's a great resource um, to just reach out. And again, to plug 988, you know, if you're in immediate crisis, call 998, press one. In Washington State, we also have other connections like Native Strong, oh, yes. Native and Strong. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of resources through that national line to get immediate support when you're in crisis. And again, really, we just want to put time and distance between that thought and acting on that. Yeah. And, and, there, and there's no charge for this, correct? There's no charge. Yeah. No, it's all, it's all free. So for the people listening, I mean, this is a, <clears throat> this, these are some people that can help you and, and, uh, and there's no charge for you and your family. Well, I, once again, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, thank you again for, for what you're doing and God bless you both. And, and, and uh, if you was in the army, I'd say hua, but, uh, but thanks <laughs> for, thanks That's a lot. That's okay. <laughs> We were born from the army. All right, so. well, all right, I got it. Hey, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks for all you do. Take care. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Tracy Neal Wald and Dr. Nicole Ayers from the Cohen Veteran Network for being with us today. And, and thank you for watching. I'm Jack F. Tilly, 12th Sergeant Major of the Army. You've been watching Your Next Mission video podcast. Please visit our website at yournextmission.org and leave me a review. I always say, I hope it's a good review, but... But it's a review. Send me something and tell me, you know, how to get better. You can also visit our nonprofit and corporate partners where you can see all the jobs and services that are available to assist you in your transition from the military. We want to assist you any way we can. I'm going to say that twice. We, all of us, want to assist you any way we can. You can follow me on all my personal social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Rumble. And if you found our discussion today with Dr. Neil Walden, Dr. Dr. Ayers Helpful, please like us. Click on that subscribe button below. And don't forget to click on the bell next to the subscribe button to receive notifications of all our upcoming video podcast releases. Remember, we want to hear from you. You can leave me a message or send me a text at 844-424-1134. Send me an email at smatilly at yournextmission.org. Thanks again to Dr. Tracy Neal Walton, Dr. Nicole Ayers from uh, the Corn Veteran Network for joining us today. It was just it was just great having them on the show. And and I, I just want to tell you something. You know, we're all part of a family. We all need to make sure that uh, we take care of each other. You're not by yourself. There's a lot of people out there that that love you and want to take care of you. But, uh, you know, dying by suicide is not the way to go. Reach out to somebody. Talk to somebody. Tell them if you got an issue. Don't sit on the couch and be by yourself. Again, we're all... 
all part of a family. We love you and, and we want to help you. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks to New Mind Studios, of course, our presenting sponsors, Navy Federal Credit Union, Purdue Global, and USAA. We appreciate all you do for our military. And as always, see you on the high ground. hoo -ah! You've been listening to Your Next Mission, brought to you by the American Freedom Foundation. Learn more by visiting yournextmission.org.